Hello and welcome to the York Creatives Podcast. My name is Ben Porter and each week you can join me as I chat to someone from York's creative community. This week's guest is Harkrit Boparai. Harkrit is a music promoter and venue manager of the Crescent. He DJs across many genres from jazz to techno and is a founding member of the Jazz Dance DJ Collective in York, where he's been playing and promoting gigs for 10 years. He also runs Jazz in York, promotes events as Ouroboros, and is a music venue trust coordinator for the northeast of England. In this episode, we discuss the changes he's witnessed during his time working in the local music scene, the issues currently facing the music industry surrounding diversity, developers, and lack of investment, and how the industry is coming together to form strong networks to support our grassroots music venues. Hi, Kurt. Welcome to the podcast. Hi there. Good to be here. I'm quite excited to actually have a chat with you because we've met a few times at events and things, but never actually managed to sit down and chat. Um, yeah. So it'd be good to sort of uh, pick your brains and learn a bit about what you know. So sure. I thought a good place to start would be asking when your journey into music began. Wow. Um, I guess as like, as a kind of teenager, maybe I was like 12, 13 when I really started to listen to music that wasn't necessarily you know, on the radio or what my big brother was listening to. Like, I remember he used to have like loads of garage CDs and, and kind of some hip hop and stuff as well. That definitely influenced me a lot. But yeah, when I was like 13 or so, I really got into like music. I remember like discovering Jimi Hendrix and it blowing my mind. Then when I was maybe 16, 17 was probably, I did some like school project, like young enterprise thing. And we put on like some events, like a comedy thing, a battle of the bands. Um, and then as I was like 17, 18, started getting into electronic music a lot more, like drum and bass, garage, dubstep, that kind of stuff. Started going to raves because I wasn't quite old enough to go to clubs. Mm -hmm. Then started putting on raves with a few friends of mine. And what as I went to uni, was this? Oh, this was like down in Reading. Okay. Um, and then when I went to uni, I got involved with like the Electronic Music Society and met a lot of the people that I'm kind of promoting with now, actually. Yeah. So you came to uni in York? Came to uni in York, um, yeah, when I was 20 and studied politics and then human rights, and then worked for a few charities for a bit and then kind of found myself back in York, working for a charity in York um, after working in London for a bit. And then um, just kind of fell, kind of fell into doing gigs again. Like it just kind of happened naturally, I guess, after, after doing work with festivals and so on. Like it was always a hobby until about four or five years ago um, when I took a job at the basement and then a year or two later, I took a job at the Crescent. So when you came to York, what year was that roughly? I'd say maybe 2010. It's probably about 10 years I've been since I first came to York. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what was going on at that point in time in York? What, what did you get involved well, with? Well, you know, it was really um, healthy, actually, I think, um, compared to what it is now. And I, I say that in like a loving, caring way, right? So you had kind of stereo, Duchess, Fibbers, um, Ziggy's or, you know, Mansion, as it then got called, went through so many different permutations over the years. And I guess I was coming to it more from like an electronic music thing. So there are a few different venues where people were doing things. But one thing that really struck me was there was a kind of, um, there were nights that like both students and locals were going towards. And this is something that since then I've been trying to like recreate a little bit like nights like Freakin or Herbal Mafia or even Breaks which was like the student society electronic music night was really kind of healthily attended by both and those two communities interacted a lot more than I think they do now in some ways it was kind of small small city but still quite healthy I think for a city of its size but unfortunately I think since then we've Part of the reason a lot of these nights have come under pressure is because of lack of venues to do stuff in. You know, and the Crescent was started kind of really out of the ashes of the Duchess and Fibbers, like the Stonebow area shutting down. So why did Fibbers and the Duchess shut down? Well, fundamentally, the building was bought by developers and turned into flats and a gym. Mm. you know which isn't unique to that no I mean, the <laughs> same thing has happened to stereo the same thing is happening right now to fibbers and probably salvation as well actually which you know might not be my place venue of choice but it's definitely serves a role in our city mm. so what kind of threats are music venues facing other than developers 
other than developers, um, coronavirus is <laughs> actually like, I mean, that's, well, that's probably, the big one. <laughs> that's the big one. Uh, pre COVID, then. Pre COVID. Um, I would say also, and something that's kind of really come to light now is being chronically underfunded. And you don't actually realize this until you look to the rest of Europe. Like, when I look at the offers venues and promoters are able to make to bands, like UK bands, compared to what those UK bands would get in the UK, it's mind blowing. Um, so that's government. And that's because of government to? subsidy, fundamentally, because they value, they see the, the, the market value of music, you know, and that the investment that they put into it can create a massive dividend, like more so than other art forms, because it's something that almost everyone can universally enjoy. Um, so like your average venue in France or Germany might have like a third of its turnover being public subsidy, you know, whereas historically we've been very underfunded, I think, in the in the UK. Um, the Arts Council recently like uh, started a fund that was ring fenced specifically for grassroots music venues to, like, in the last year or so to try and address that. Um, but one thing, again, that I'm kind of seeing now as a lot of music venues kind of post COVID are now making Arts Council applications. And it's, um, it's kind of remarkable really how I think, to be honest, unfit the process is for them, you know, like even just the way the questions are asked or the kind of reporting that they want to see, it doesn't really work for our, for our sector in the same way it does for others. Mm. Because there has been, there's funding for music, but it doesn't necessarily go to most of the venues. Yeah, so, you know, you have Help Musicians, you have PRS Foundation. Like, it's all focused on artists. And the Arts Council, you know, will say probably this is, you know, we're the Arts Council. We are interested in artists. But I think there needs to be a wider recognition of, you know, what we do as an art form as well. You know, I don't play an instrument, but um, I DJ a bit, but... Um, I guess what I'm trying to get at is that the promoter or the venue, they pay essential roles within um, the, the, the kind of network or the tapestry of, of, of what is the UK music scene or the world music scene. Like you can't have um, Bombay Bicycle Club or Ed Sheeran or Adele or whoever without the kind of music venues there for them to get their following, develop their, hone their show, develop their craft and kind of grow an audience. Um, so yeah, we're kind of vital steps on the ladder for many bands. I mean, look at like a York band, like Howl and the Hum, right? So recently signed, getting quite successful, you know, sell out tours. But um, actually as a York band, they don't have the um, spaces to grow and develop like they would in other cities because we've got rid of a 500 capacity venue, you know, and there's nothing now between the Crescent and the Barbican which is like 2000 capacity. So suddenly there's a whole kind of segment of these bands who are about to hit the big time that we just can't book into York anymore unless we address that venue capacity. Yeah, it's interesting, like, because you mentioned those big artists and if you think of it in one way, they are businesses because they will employ people. There's Absolutely. A whole, there's a whole... tour manager, PR, yeah. you know, uh, uh, your marketing, everything. Uh, the agent, there's a huge machine that goes into making a tour of even like a moderate size actually happen yeah and so there's obviously like there's a disconnect between those small bands or mm. if you wanted to put it in terms which i guess uh, government could see like you know small businesses growing them there's definitely there's a middle bit which is like really difficult for people to get across yes. which is probably why we're seeing all these festivals with the same headliners over and over again yes. it's hard for people to move yeah. on yeah and unfortunately covid's going to be even more damaging for that because i think almost every festival is just rebooking the same acts that they weren't able to put on last year, which what well, uh, this year, which whilst you can see is valid from like maybe a ticket buyer's point of view. If you think about it from um, the band who next year might have been their year, you know, their albums due out, the agency was going to push them onto certain festival lineups, certain, and it's like a vital moment in their kind of eruption as a as a band. Um, yeah, so I think there's we're going to see like a kind of stunted growth for a lot of these bands, unfortunately. So what is the industry doing to try and fight back against all this? Well, I think um, they've done quite a good job of campaigning for a, a cultural bailout for the government. 
I don't know if that cultural bailout is enough, but fundamentally that's what we need to be doing is trying to push the government to value our industry properly and support it fully until such a time as when we can open up again fully. You know, we've been doing some gigs recently uh, in collaboration with Fulford Arms and NCEM, um, like some outdoor gigs. And it's kind of very, very evident that the costs just do not stack up. Um, someone's either working for free or taking, you know, making a loss somewhere. Um, yeah, and I'm not sure that the, the money that's been announced, a kind of one and a half billion fund is actually going to be enough for all of the venues, theatres, museums, heritage sites all over the country. At the moment, it's a kind of wait and see how that pans out. I think we're due to hear back by the beginning of October. Um, and then after that, I think, yeah, fundamentally, we should be pushing for more. You know, we should be pushing for them to uh, extend the self-employed scheme for the creative industries, potentially targeted furlough for industries. Because actually relative to the kind of economic output we generate um you know we're talking a billion pound economy um, massive export value uk music market what we're asking for is probably a tiny bit of investment to keep us going till a point where it's viable safe sorry to open up at full capacity again so part of the campaign um there's a trust music venue trust which you're involved with um can you tell me a bit about that when that was set up yeah, so Music Venue Trust was set out uh, maybe like five years ago. I, 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 only, I only really became aware of them over the last two or three years. Um, so essentially, it's a charity set up to help advocate for policies that affect grassroots music venues, kind of, and, and also act as a network for them. So, um, and I think throughout this process, it's been a really kind of incredible to see i don't think probably any other creative sector has had an organization as effective as the mvt um in terms of lobbying creating campaigns uh, assisting with crowd funders creating a central fund to help venues who are kind of you know literally getting threats from landlords about eviction and so on and i think the level of support from them has been absolutely phenomenal um, but even prior to this, I think the Music Venue Trust was really central in some amazing changes like the agent of change principle. So we were talking about earlier about developers and their impact on music venues. Um, so like a common thing would be, uh, say, an office building turning into flats next door to a music venue, someone moving in and then starting to make complaints that affect the operation of that venue. And a lot of venues have gone this way. So the agent of change principle is a change they managed to successfully lobby to put into planning regulations that means that it's the responsibility of a developer or the person making the change in order to protect against the noise that's coming from that venue um, if that's the kind of normal operating business of that place so that was actually a massive change like it's a kind of minor thing in planning but it's a massive change in direction um uh, something that has really kind of plagued music venues, especially over the last 10, 20 years where we've had this kind of massive development rush. Mm. And the Crescent's been threatened by that, hasn't it? With developed- Absolutely. We've got developers on three sides of us, you know, so. Um, and, you know, some of them have been more willing to talk and have a conversation about, you know, one of one of the, on one side of us, we had something that was, was going to be a hotel, like a luxury stay city apart hotel. Um, to their credit, they've now changed that plan for an office. We're still kind of concerned about some things. On the other side, we had um, what was a nursery that was then proposed to be turned into uh, flats. Then they changed it to kind of Airbnb. Um, that planning was rejected, but the developers now reached out to us to see, you know, we proposed coming up with another thing that Music Venue Trust, which is pioneered, which is called a deed of easement which is basically like um, a kind of legal agreement that stops, that s- says that, you know, you've got to kind of state when someone moves in, you're moving in next to a music venue, don't complain about noise, which is actually like a really common sense thing. Yeah, but people know. do it all the time. People do it all the time. People absolutely do. really frustrates me because like, I heard someone say an example of like, you wouldn't move to a seaside town and complain that it smells like fish and then get rid of all the fishing industry. 
Yeah. People think it's okay to do it about music. Absolutely. I think, again, it talks to this kind of narrative that I think is undervalued music, um, live music, not just as a economic force, but as a cultural force. Like we are just as culturally valuable as... Uh, a, an art gallery or a museum or a theater i think we need to change our narrative around what is culture how do we fund it and and what do we want to see from it because when someone comes to uh, you know comes to a, and buys a gig ticket to the crescent they might spend a tenner on that ticket but they might also spend 20 pound on drinks 10 pound on food around the corner maybe another 10 pound on taxis so for every tenner they've spent on a ticket it's generating so much more in terms of that in terms of um you know other aspects of that local economy it's um uh, you know we're not we weren't really being championed as a kind of major kind of tourist attraction for the city but if actually when i look through the amount of people we have through our doors on a on a yearly basis it's it's massive you know so i think part of it is about changing that narrative and that's why we try to work together again with chris at the fulford arms in creating a york music venue network so like a more localized version of what the music venue trust are doing and we lobbied our local council to pass a motion kind of pledging to recognize york's venues as a cultural and economic asset um, recognizing that it kind of really plays into a lot of their strategies around a safe nighttime economy, around safe tourism and so on, and also pledging to protect us um, from developers and more kind of unnecessary shutdowns. And they passed that motion unanimously, you know, so they, they were actually able to recognize that. So now it's been an interesting process trying to work with the council a bit closer Um and things like the cultural leaders group and so on. The, whereas York venues didn't really have a voice in that process before. I think we just kind of existed separately. Um, so it's really been interesting to and kind of heartening to see our local council want to engage with this issue a bit more. So obviously 2020 has brought quite a lot of challenges. Um, there's been COVID and then there's been all the, um, the Black Lives Matter stuff, which has caused a lot of people to kind of take a step back and really evaluate um, yeah. different things about their industry, um, diversity being one. Where do you think we can make improvements with diversity? Yeah, so I think there's kind of a few ways you need to approach this issue. And it is really important because, um, you know, for years we see kind of issues with you know, not very balanced lineups, um, people not really getting the opportunities that they deserve. And I mean, not just on stage, but off stage as well. Um, I often think about like, why is it that the majority of sound engineers are like white men? Why the majority of venue owners, promoters, you know, technicians, it is a very white male dominated industry. And, um, I don't know, coming into it, I really felt that. And I think there's a few different reasons. Um, like personally for me, part of it is actually just cultural. Is that, you know, from you know, when I was growing up, like a typical Indian family, they want you to be like a doctor or a lawyer or um, they were a bit kind of like surprised when I was like, oh, this is what I do now. Um, but at the same time, a lot of it is just because um, so much of this industry is really based around like an almost old boys club. Like it's very much based around the personal relationships you have with people. And then also that some places kind of struggle with changing demographics or really trying to address different demographics in terms of what they're putting on. So one thing when I started getting into kind of putting on gigs was... I was very interested in, say, for example, how do we make a scene like jazz, which even though it originated in black music, is really kind of had really become the domain of kind of old white men nursing a pint in a corner. And I really wanted to change that. So um, I, I, I like a couple of years ago, I got like some money, not much, like a thousand pounds from help musicians to do a series of gigs kind of focusing on gender and I focused on other kind of aspects of diversity in jazz as well um just to try and challenge that a bit and like Ouroboros for example is really like you know through booking things like Afrobeat hip-hop and really kind of diverse music taste but also diverse not just in genre but 
in terms of race, um, gender, and so on. So even and that's in a place where York probably has a reputation for maybe not being the most diverse city going. Although I think it's definitely changed since I moved here. Actually, it's become a lot more diverse from when I first moved here ten years ago. So I think the challenges are kind of present at all levels of the industry. Um, and the route forward is, yeah, start at the top. So it's encouraging to see today that UK Music's kind of new chair is 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 black. Um, it, then also trying to um, develop alternative networks. That might be for artists, agents, promoters, and trying to change the way that... Um, some of the kind of traditional touring networks work so in order to get some kind of really exciting stuff into a place like york you have to really kind of pitch for it and if you can pitch together as you know two or three venues you might be able to try and get them to the attention of the agents a bit more yeah so i think networks can play a really important role in that yeah, because yeah, a lot of it's about visibility as well. Like, I think this is the thing with, I'm sure, many small places, but what gets me in York is that there is so much interesting um, stuff going on here that people don't tend to hear about. The perception that certain people have of York is very different to the reality because they're not looking in the places where people are taking risks and putting on different things. And so helping, as you're saying, put networks together, share these stories with people once people start to see, oh, there is interesting new things going on here, yeah. it makes people more comfortable to come out and put on their own things. Yes. Yeah, no, I definitely think that's true, you know. And say, for example, like if you're like a young promoter who's come in as a student, like I did 10 years ago, or like Bob, who owns The Crescent, did 15 years ago, what is it that's wanting to make you stay in York to be a creative person? I think this actually applies to like a lot of creative industries. What is it that stops you going to a more young, hip, diverse place like Leeds, where it's cheaper to live, where it's, I think part of it is you need to be able to kind of find a scene that, you know, you're excited about with, it's got other people in there who maybe look like you or are into the same kind of stuff as you. Uh, but also it's got to have space for you to grow in and space for you to kind of like develop and hone your talent in. Um, and I feel like York's kind of getting there, but I feel like it's not quite there yet because we still kind of lose so much talent away when that student finishes their degree and they'll be like, oh, I'll just move to Leeds because it's cooler or because it's cheaper or because there's more, you know, there's more pe opportunities for people like me there. Yes, but I'm really passionate about this city and trying to like develop that and grow that and change that. And I think there's so many other people in the city who are as well. And it's just about how can we work together more to get to shout about what it is that we're all doing, you know? And yeah, I think that that's the big first part is like you say, getting role models and getting people to think, oh, I could do that too. You know, I don't have to like do my, whatever, you know, accountancy or whatever it is that my mum wants me to do yeah so tell me about some of your events obviously up to covid you were organizing a lot of jazz things like that yeah 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 so i um I, like one of the things i found um really into over the last kind of two three years was like the kind of uk jazz scene and that there was a lot of young often diverse uh, often urban kind of artists like reinterpreting jazz through the lens of the like many different genres that they've grown up on so like you would be listening to a jazz track but you might hear like kind of drum and bass or garage or grime coming through that um and i found that really interesting or just kind of challenging the concepts of like when i first started putting on jazz um a lot of the uh, bands that were approaching me to play were i don't know maybe and a lot of the scene was maybe i don't know trying to put it kindly but maybe focused on like an older demographic mm -hmm. And I wanted to put on jazz that people could dance to, you know. And so that's something I've been really kind of pushing with Ouroboros, which is a night I run with Joe Coates. Where we really, we, it's not just, I think what, what we're kind of interested in is music that pushes or challenges the idea of what even genre is, you know. Um, and just trying to use it as a vehicle for stuff that otherwise wouldn't be being booked in York. So... Things like, um, you know, Afrobeat or, uh, 
you know, uh, kind of weird psych electronica stuff. Um, just things that are often things that haven't fitted into boxes of what other promoters are doing have kind of weirdly fitted into our box. So if people are potentially interested in getting into this world, maybe they want to have a chat with you, ask you some advice. Can they do that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one thing that we are always very big on at the Crescent is if like, if you're a young person, maybe, or not necessarily a young person, if you're someone who like wants to put on a gig, come and speak to us and we'll do everything we can to make it like cost effective for you to do so and kind of guide you through that process. Um, you know, because I think mentorship is so important in this as well. Like one thing I was really grateful when I did that scheme with help musicians around kind of getting more diversity into jazz. Um, you know, I had a mentor and it was mind blowing in a way because it suddenly opened up like this national scene that was going on um, that I just thought, you know, prior I just was doing something maybe as a laugh to just as a bit of fun. And I kind of thought I was banging my head against a brick wall. Like it was just me siloed by myself. But suddenly I had a mentor who introduced me to, you know, people who run Manchester Jazz Festival or who program at the Sage Gateshead or, you know, or who runs a venue in London. And so many opportunities came very quickly off the back of that, like bands that I didn't have access to before or, you know, just being able to have conversations with people that I couldn't before. And people really suddenly started like valuing my opinion, like wanted me to speak at a panel or wanted me to be a board member of a, you know, a, a, of a jazz promotion network and so on. And I feel like part of it was about the confidence to, to do all that. But it's also just about even knowing that those opportunities are there and that people would value your opinion, you know. Um, yeah. So mentorship, I think, is a really big thing that we could all be doing more of. Yeah. And it becomes a two-way thing as well. Like if you give a bit, you get a lot back. Absolutely. You learn as well. Yeah. hundred yeah. percent. So what's the best way for people to get in touch, get in touch with you? Um, probably just hit me up, Twitter, Facebook, whatever. If you want to get in touch with The Crescent, you can email thecrescentyork at gmail.com. Um, and just probably like bear with us because it's a bit all a bit hectic at the moment. But yeah, I'm hoping, you know, within the next few weeks we'll hear back from the arts council as will other venues in york like the fulford arms the victoria vaults and so on i think that will be the moment to really take stock and say okay we'll either know if we're funded or not for the next six months and we'll know then what is the next actions for us to take and i think that's when we're really going to be reaching out to people of york and to promoters, creative people, to think about how can we use our spaces in different ways than we already are and utilize them a bit more to give back to a kind of wider community than we were already dealing with. Well, fingers crossed. Wicked. <laughs> Thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks very much, man. It's been a pleasure.